I'd now like to introduce um, Dr. David Best, who's Associate Press Professor at uh, Monash University and Turning Point. Um, we're very happy to have David here today. Um, his work in mental health and people's recovery from drug and alcohol addiction is extremely interesting and, uh, and very important. So please join me in welcoming David. Thank you. Good morning and, and thank you very much for, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> I intend to talk in a fairly narrow focus about the nature of recovery and its fundamentally social embeddedness. Um, and that really will be the primary focus. And I think, although my work has primarily been around alcohol and drug recovery, this is a generic, this is a, 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 a constant theme in desistance or recovery. I've also done some work around desistance from offending and the emerging uh, positive criminology movement. I think some of the things that I say in regard to alcohol and drug recovery have generic application. Um, much of the, the evidence I'll present from my own work comes from the fact that between England, Scotland and Australia, I've gathered something like 1,500 recovery stories over the course of the last six or seven years. And much of what I talk about will draw on the, the evidence that comes from that. But really, I guess there are probably, if, if any of you have be better things to do than listen to, listen to me, there are only two things that I'd want to, to say really about recovery. One is people recover through other people. And two, people recover by spending time with other people who are in recovery. And those are really the key points. So if, if that's, that's it, that's all I'm going to say. There's going to be a whole lot of slides now, but that's everything important. So I'm going to talk about the importance of connections. I'm going to relate it to the role of social capital. Uh, I'll say a little bit about what I think is a crucial part of addiction recovery, which is, which is about identity change. And there was a long debate in the addictions field about the restoration of a spoiled identity. But for me, that identity is not a personal identity. It's a social identity. And it's the social identity change that I think is, is critical to the, um, the process of long-term recovery. And I'll say a little bit, but not too much, about how we've tested and mapped that model. And, but the other core theme that I, I intend to explore is how do you get people actively involved in meaningful activities? And how do you get people actively involved in social groups? And the process that, that we use for, for describing that is called assertive linkage. An assertive linkage is really about how do we, how can we manipulate the recovery process? So that's going to be one of the core things. And I'll say a little bit about my own work and what I'm doing next in this space, uh, just because I'll be kind of self-indulgent and it is all about me. Okay, so starting with some very general stuff that's nothing to do with alcohol and drug dependence. Um, there's a, there's a well-known meta-analysis that was conducted, uh, reported in 2010, which basically showed that individuals with adequate relationships have a 50% greater likelihood of survival compared to those with poor or insufficient social relationships. This has nothing to do with mental health or alcohol and drugs. Basically, if you are well-connected and linked to other people, your morbidity and mortality risks are significantly reduced. Um, and likewise, the more, you, the more groups you participate in, the better protected you are. And that volunteering is a good mechanism of increasing that protection. So just to illustrate that point, um, and you could misinterpret this slide as people have done when I've presented this before. This is the public health benefit, the, the impact of stopping smoking and stopping excessive binge drinking. And for another public health comparator that I'll come back to shortly, this is the equivalent for reduction uh, for weight control. However, you will see a much greater effect size for improved social connectedness. The, the message you shouldn't take from this is keep smoking but get an extra friend. <laughs> this is not, I'm not speaking on behalf of Imperial Tobacco. Um, nonetheless, the point is, improved social connectedness 
has a stronger effect on reduced morbidity and mortality than stopping smoking does. And it's worth just reflecting on that for a second. Connectedness has a powerful effect, not just on psychological well-being, but on physical well-being. And we, we also need to understand this in terms of how behaviours happen and how behaviours changes. So one of the core concepts in the notion of addiction recovery is the idea of social contagion. And there was a wonderful study that I'm sure some of you will have heard of before called the Framingham Heart Study. <clears throat> and this, for this study, we owe an enormous debt of gratitude to uh, sexually transmitted diseases because it was an outbreak of sexually transmitted disease in, in Framingham that led to the City Fathers uh, establishing this longitudinal study where every two to four years, virtually all of the adult population have three things measured. They are given a physical, there's a blood test, and they're asked who their social connections are. So what this allows the researchers to do is to look at connections at time one and see what they predict two to four years later. And the starting point for this was, well, with heart disease, this was an important predictor of the spread of heart disease in populations. But it covered a whole range of other behaviors, surprising other behaviors, so that the person's odds of becoming obese at time two increased by 57% if they had a friend who became obese at time one. In other words, contact with obesity significantly alters your likelihood of becoming obese at the next time point. And a whole range of behaviors, unpredicted behaviors, were subject to the same social contagion effects. So smoking is so it replied not only to the onset of behavior, but the desistance of behavior. So smoking cessation spreads in social networks. Divorce spreads in social networks. A whole range of behaviours are mediated through social network change. And I'm grateful to the authors, Christakis and Fowler, for sharing some of their slides with me. And this is an example of a social network map, which shows, you know, so the key issues here are the individual blocks or the nodes, and these are the links between them. And the, the, the point of the, the study was to demonstrate how behaviour shifts across social networks. So the three core concepts of this are contagion, which is what flows, connection, which is uh, who is connected to who, so what, what the direction of contagion will be. And crucially, for the more socially focused behaviors was the notion of homophily, which is the tendency of similar people to link together. And homophily is crucial to the idea of addiction recovery. And we know from lots and lots of studies, if on completion of a treatment, you go back to your using friends and using networks, your relapse risk is almost 100%. That if you move to non-using networks, and very famously in the largest ever addiction study called Project Match, Richard Longabau concluded that successful recovery was best predicted by switching from network supportive of drinking to network supportive of recovery. In other words, social network and the rules and norms of those social network predict change. Okay, your friends' friends can make you fat. The left-hand model here is Framingham in 1975. Well, this is a cross-section of Framingham in 1975. Green nodes represent non-obese individuals. Yellow nodes represent uh, obese individuals. This is not a causal rule. Connection to somebody who's obese doesn't but of itself cause obesity, but it significantly increases the odds that obesity will happen. And you can see that there are clear clusters here Emerging. Frustratingly for me, I can never get the dynamic slide to work. But there are clusters, and obesity spreads in clusters, and with an ironic sense of humor, the size of the node represents the individual's body mass index in this slide. The point about this is that behavior change is bi-directional. In other words, 
both the dominance of the target behavior obesity or the transition to non-obesity is socially contagious. It's bi-directional. It goes both ways. And it goes both ways based on the attractiveness of the models who, who display the behavior. The two primary determinants of contagion are group structure and norm and behavior attractiveness. So divorce, for instance. In the Framingham Heart Study, the spread of divorce was most likely um, when a sibling became divorced. From at time one, that predicted an individual's odds of becoming divorced at time two most greatly, followed by a friend, followed by a colleague. And for all of these behavior changes, it's up to three degrees of separation, their statistical significance and the predictiveness of behavior change. So, your friends, your friends' friends, your friends' friends' friends becoming obese change your likelihood of you becoming obese two to four years later. How does that work? Because the process is about connections and normative behavior. And the process of recovery is about connections and normative behavior. The and this, so this model works beautifully in framing them for the spread of binge drinking, for the spread of smoking cessation, for the spread of a range of, of behaviors. The model is about social connectedness and its impact on behavior. And contagion is a good metaphor, and maybe more than a metaphor, to use in this context. The second conceptual frame for us is the notion of social capital. And social capital are the resources that people have to draw on. But they are also the bind that individuals have to those social resources. So to the extent that behavior change is predicated on contagion and group norms and behaviors, the second factor underpinning addiction recovery are the resources individuals have access to, and in particular, the social resources individuals have access to. There are two primary types. The first type is called bonding capital. And bonding capital is about the strengths of the bond to other members of the group. And bridging and linking capital, although I've got them here as separate things, really are about the connections between one group and other, other groups in, in the in the community. Bonding capital is about the extent of social embeddedness. Bridging and linking capital are about how different groups link to each other. For mental health, for alcohol and drugs, the problem frequently will be that individuals of high bonding capital among homogenized homophilic groups. However, they will have very weak bridging and linking capital, as I will attempt to demonstrate in a minute. When we've translated this concept into the idea of recovery capital, we've talked about recovery capital as being the breadth and depth of the internal and external resources that can be drawn upon to initiate and sustain recovery from alcohol and drugs. And within a positive model, positive psychology, positive criminology, one of the big breakthroughs in our field was that the predictiveness of long-term recovery was much better done on the basis of strengths and capital than it was done on the basis of pathology. In other words, symptoms and complexities predicted long-term recovery much more poorly than personal and social recovery capital. And based on research I'd done in the UK, I worked with an American researcher called Alexandra Lodi, and we developed this model of three component parts to the likelihood of people recovering quantifiable model of recovery likelihood, and we've developed a scale called the assessment of recovery capital that allows us to do this, but it allows us to contextualize and measure three components that are crucial to the recovery process. So the first part of the likelihood that somebody will recover is their personal capital, and it's strengths focused. So this is resilience and coping skills, self-esteem and self-efficacy. Social recovery capital is the positive connections individuals have in their community, both bridges and bonds. So the strength of their link to resources 
immediate personal resources that includes that question of how well linked in and connected are they to their own family, their friendship networks, how many people do they have. And then crucially for us, there was a collective or community recovery capital that's about availability and access to contagion. So are there people out there that can act as the catalysts or carriers of recovery in the local community that individuals can, can access and get hold of? And <clears throat> just before the talk, uh, I, was, I was speaking to, to Don and um, we, uh, I was discussing this notion of, uh, um, of mutual aid groups and peer groups. And one of the key questions about mutual aid and peer groups is, do they provide sufficient visibility of recovery to allow it to become contagious? In other words, are there in your community sufficient examples of successful recovery to enable effective contagion to happen. In the absence of effective role models, the likelihood of contagion is significantly reduced. If you accept the contagion model, effectively recovery transmits from one person to another in exactly the same way that active addiction transmits from one person to another. And that if you have a world where there are no visible icons of recovery, no successful examples, the likelihood of successfully initiating recovery is diminished. In the same way that high levels of stigma and high levels of discrimination are likely to be significant barriers to people being visible champions for recovery. And so high levels of stigma and discrimination themselves act as fundamental barriers to community or collective recovery capital. So I'm going to say a little bit about some of the work that I've done. I wanted to start with a study that, that we generally refer to as the Goya study after the Spanish painter Goya. So we did this, the, this study um, where we looked at a lot of people in long-term recovery from alcohol and, and, and heroin use. Uh, and we found that there were two overarching predictors of well-being and quality of life of people in long-term recovery. The first was the number of other people in recovery in their social network. The second was a very basic count of how much they did in the last week. So we simply looked at how many hours in the last week had somebody spent um, parenting, volunteering, in education training, or, um, education training or employment. Uh, and what we found was the more hours, the better somebody's quality of life. Why is this called the Goya study? It's called the Goya study because Goya stands for get off your arse. This is a highly technical scientific term. And what we, when we first did this, people said, no, you've got this wrong. It's the case that people with better quality of life are, are, are more capable of doing things in, the, in their community. And that's not the case. We went back and reanalyzed the data. When people start engaging in activities, their quality of life goes up. When they stop engaging in meaningful activities, their quality of life goes down. It's as close to a clear causal relationship as we could find. And we also reported this uh, among clients in long-term drug treatment. The same effect pertained that when people initiated any of those forms of meaningful activity, their, their self-reported quality of life went up. When they stopped any of those forms of activity, it went down. And one of the models that I wanted to, to describe in this, I'm going to start with a, a study done by one of my colleagues from the University of Queensland called Genevieve Dingle, uh, who did this relatively small scale pilot study, but I just think its exploratory model is very, very useful for us. And what she did was got people to sing in a choir. In other words, this is the first of the studies I intend to talk about this about assertive linkage. So she got people with long-term mental health problems, and she actively, assertively linked them into uh, a choir in the community. And what she reported was, and I'll use the recovery capital language, although I've used her slide here. What she reported was that the initial benefit of singing in the choir was an improvement in personal capital that manifested itself as better emotion regulation, lower negative emotions, some kind of spiritual impact, and crucially, some kind of changed self-perception of accomplishment. In her model, she argued <coughs> that this triggered an improvement in social capital. And the improvement in social capital 
manifested itself as better connectedness with other choir members, with the community and with the audience. And that through doing that, it had a third knock-on effect, which was what she referred to as functional outcomes, but I'll refer to as community recovery capital. The reason I do that is because I've used this model to apply to work that a PhD student of, of mine ha has done in the north of England. So Sarah Landale um, did her PhD looking at a very specific group of people. So to be, be eligible for this Home Office funded project, the, the participants had to have fulfilled three basic conditions. They had to have been arrested three times in the last year. Under testing on arrest in the UK, they had to have been positive for heroin and or crack cocaine, and they had to have refused to engage in standard treatment. If they fulfilled all of those conditions, they were eligible for this programme, which was called Sporting Chance, and its name was later changed to Second Chance. And what that basically meant was, instead of trying to do any blah, blah, blah talking therapies, what we tried to do was get people involved in football. Different country, different shape of ball, but I guess the principle is basically the same. The point of this was, could we use sport as a way of actively engaging this group of, of what were typically young men between the ages of 18 and 30 in meaningful activity? And these were the main effects we got, but I want, I want to go back to this slide to explain what happened. With this group of typically very socially excluded young men, participation in the football team had pretty much the same kind of effect. It started to give people who had very low self-esteem some sense of accomplishment. It started to allow them to show some level of impulsivity and emotion control and regulation because they had to, to manage to, to engage with the, the process. And through doing that, it started to change their level of connectedness with other members of the team. But I think the most crucial part is the, the, the sample for the Sporting Chance programme were typically um, young socially excluded males from um, fairly deprived cities in the northeast of England, mainly Newcastle, uh, who typically lived in housing estates consisting of other largely socially excluded groups. And those socially excluded groups would typically consist of other drinkers and drug users and people in and out of prison. What was important about this, this project was this link between social capital and community capital. Because in Newcastle, what typically would happen was, even if there was some big urban regeneration project that was about housing or training or employment, most of the young men that we saw either never heard about those projects, or if they heard about them, would say, well, they were nothing to do with me. They're not for the likes of me. I wouldn't be welcome in this kind of thing. I'm a well-known offender. I'm a well-known face. They're not going to have me. The point of this model is personal improvements in personal recovery capital, improved sense of well-being, better emotion regulation, allowed people to shift and change their social networks. So they started developing bridging and linking capital to different people. In other words, not just stronger bonds to other drug-using offenders but links to people involved in the football teams, the coaches, and what that allowed them to do was access to opportunity and information. They found out about stuff that went on in their own communities, and they started being able to take advantage of it. So some of the young people who'd been involved in this project got new houses, started doing new training courses, got some jobs. And this is the point about this process is a linear process, and it's, it's not realistically presented as a linear process. It's not a linear process. But what's important here was that there was a growth in well-being that led to a change in personal identity. And the per change in personal identity was mediated by the new social networks. And those new social networks were reinforced by access to different kinds of opportunity that wasn't simply self-perpetuating. This was a diversionary scheme. The alternative for this group of young recidivistic offenders was they went to jail again. And what happens to their social networks if they go to jail? There's more social exclusion. They're more narrowly bonded to other drug using offenders, and they have no access to opportunity. I'm not trying to justify or defend diversionary programs. I'm merely pointing out the impact on social capital and community capital if you create those 
those bridges and those opportunities. And underpinning, <clears throat> underpinning this for me is a social identity change. What happens that's fundamental to this process is that people's social identity shifts. It shifts away from a social identity of addict or offender to a social identity that becomes much more complex and diverse as the number of different social groups people engage in multiplies and diversifies. There's a significant uh, conceptual model underpinning this work. And it is, this was, so this is based on social identity theory and self-categorization theory from, from social psychology. However, it's based on the notion, firstly, that belonging to groups is generally good for you. But if you belong to groups that are socially excluded, it has adverse effects on self-esteem and well-being. Um, but that being a member of a group provides you with a frame of reference to interpret situations and context and allows you a way of simply... So group membership is not just about what resources you get from the group. It also provides you with a set of norms and values and rules and roles through which you can interpret how the world is. It gives you a lens for interpreting the world. Um, it also helps to shape who people are. So the notion that's central to this is this idea that how you understand yourself is partly determined by what groups you belong to. And belonging to addict or using groups, drinking groups, creates for you a fundamentally different social identity than belonging to recovery groups and uh, other forms of community group. They provide access not only to individuals, they also provide access to value systems. And the value systems are core to the uh, social identity rules and norms. They influence our sense of well-being. And generally the rule is the more groups you belong to, the better effect it has on your self-esteem. But if you're a member of socially excluded uh, groups, it has the opposite effect. As I mentioned earlier, um, the, one, of the re, one of the most powerful predictors of people recovering from alcoholism, as in Project Match, is the transition from a group supportive of drinking with all the rules and norms about drinking behavior. And as a psychologist, I should point out that we're not very good at getting people to do refusal skills. Life is much easier with drinkers if they spend time with loads of people who never go near a pub than trying to persuade people to go to the pub and say no to drink. And also, if your membership of the group relies on you not drinking, not just that the group doesn't drink, but the social identity of the group excludes drinking as an accepted normative behavior. And that's why mutual aid groups and peer groups are crucial to the, 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 the uh, recovery model as a model of social, uh, social well-being. We did some work in Melbourne where we looked at a youth cohort study of 150 young people going through treatment. And there were three conditions that pertained at the end of this. So, and this was entirely predictable. For young people who completed specialist alcohol and drug treatment and went back to the same peer social group, their likelihood of relapse was almost 100%. It was as, as good as you could get to say, if they returned to the same social network, they would relapse. For people whose solution to that question was, I'm going to avoid my social network and my solution is going to be I'm going to lock myself in a house with a whole load of videos and, and lots of tins of soup and if I don't have any drug using friends it's not a problem. They both developed psychological health problems and relapsed. Only the young people who successfully managed to transition from using groups to non-using recovery groups had a significantly elevated chance of sustaining their own personal recovery. And this is critical. Now, it's massively difficult. And as you can imagine, it's very difficult for adolescents to find social networks that don't drink and don't use drugs. And that is where assertive linkage processes matter. Because it's critical that, firstly, you review and evaluate who their networks are and assess what social capital exists for recovery in that group. And in the absence of existing indigenous recovery resources, you have to assertively link people in to those resources, identify them first, and then link people in. 
So what, just to, to show that, say a little bit more about this question of identity change, this is a study we've recently done in a therapeutic community in Queensland. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to, um, <coughs> we wanted to look at how social identity changes in the initial weeks of engaging in a therapeutic community. And not surprisingly, when people go into therapeutic communities, basically their identification with the therapeutic community goes up a bit and their identification with their using group goes down a bit. These are means and they dis disguise massive variability. But in the first two weeks, the extent to which successful identification with the TC increased and the extent to which identification with the using group decreased predicted the likelihood of completion and the number of days retained in the TC. In other words, if you don't discard your using group identity when you go into a therapeutic community, you're, you're much li more likely to drop out and fail. If you buy the identity of the community in that early couple of weeks, you're much more likely to stay and last the course. And with therapeutic communities for drugs, there are two predictors of long-term success. One is completion, and the second is engaging in aftercare after completion. So we know this is a proxy outcome, that people who don't discard the using identity, who keep in touch with the same using groups throughout their time in, in the therapeutic community, are much more vulnerable to failure and drop out. And this, for us, is about identity change. So we're trying to develop this method that's around assertive linkage, that's about mapping out what people's social networks look like as a mechanism for determining the extent to which they will need assertive linkage to community resources. And it's great fun because what we do is we get people to take a whole pile of sticky notes and post-it notes and coloured dots and to map out their social networks. And so essentially what we've, what we've been doing recently is to say, what resources for recovery do people have? And we've, we're just on our second study for this and we've just got uh, some money from the Australian Research Council to do our three year study of network change in people completing long term treatment. The point of this is, is crucial. I, I, and one of the things I think that I'll give you a real example because it makes it easier to show. So, the person puts themselves in the centre of the map, and then they identify all the different groups they belong to, but crucially, they colour code the members of those maps. So, people in red, red dots represent active users. For this individual, and green represents, I think green represents people in recovery. In this map, what we have here basically is a massive risk network. If this individual comes out of treatment and goes back to these groups, they will fail. However, they have some recovery supportive identities. The point about this is to map out, are there existing recovery resources in their social network that they can be tapped into? If there are, the demand for assertive linkage is significantly reduced. And bear in mind, the premise that I started with was twofold. You have to belong to groups for your well-being. And that recovery behaviour, behaviour is contagious. So the more time you spend in these groups, the better your recovery is protected. The more time you spend in these groups, the more your recovery is at risk. This was also very good because when we did these initial maps, there was a real kind of penny drop moment for the, pe for the people we were working with who were saying, right, if I'm serious about this, I can't be going near any of these kind of groups and populations. And when we looked at, I've got, I had a, a, an honour student do some work on this with young people uh, in detox and rehab uh, through YSAS, which is the Youth Substance Abuse Service. And what we found was that the basic notion of connectedness really mattered. So people who were connected, the basic premise of social, uh, of social well-being, the more connected people were, this link to their personal and social recovery capital. If you're a member of groups, you do better. You've got more resources. But if those groups have lots of alcohol and drug using members, this doesn't do well. So group connectedness is beneficial for young people completing treatment. But if the, if the uh, groups consist of people who are alcohol and drug users, it has a damaging effect. And for those of you who run 
peer community groups. Let this be a little warning, and I, I hope none of you would do this, which is you take a whole load of people who are highly damaged in the first few weeks after formal treatment and stick them all in a room and tell them to form some kind of peer group. And you create these kind of conditions of misery and failure and the social contagion only of lack of success. You have to have people who are vibrant, attractive role models for contagion, for group effects to be beneficial in this model. The, the notion of taking a whole load of people uh, early on and sticking them all together and hoping that magically they'll get better. You know, you may know better in your areas, areas but in alcohol and drugs, that just doesn't work. And bear in mind, the other core point about this presentation is about assertive linkage. And the, the, the unfortunate message for professionals here is the Goya that I referred to also refers to professionals. Get off your arse. You have to know how, if you want people to succeed who don't have existing recovery resources and don't have social or community capital, you have to find out what's out there and you have to get people linked into it. So just to give you a, <coughs> a two little study, this is a very old study, but a beautiful example of this. Assertive linkage does not mean giving people leaflets. So this is a randomized trial where 20 alcohol outpatients were randomized to standard referral processes, which is give people a list of meetings and the clinician says it would be a really nice thing if you attended, or an intensive process which was in the session, there's a phone call to a 12-step group member that says, speak to this person now. What did we get in this? Well, we didn't get this. What happened in this little randomized trial? When people get leaflets of the 10 people who just got that leaflet, how many attended a meeting? Zero. When there was an intensive assertive follow-up, 100% attended at least one meeting. You have to get, do things to get people actively engaged. Um, when I worked at the, uh, I worked for, for a number of years at the Institute of Psychiatry in London, um, and one of my colleagues, Victoria Manning, um, led a study where we, we basically tested uh, um, assertive linkage. So we had a, a, an emergency seven to 10 day admissions ward called the Acute Assessment Unit, which was basically for groin and neck injectors and people who were fitting from alcohol. So real kind of high end problematic severe clients. Um, and what we wanted to do, there were, there were typically very low rates of engagement with the Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Cocaine Anonymous groups that were held on the Maudsley Hospital grounds. So what we did was we ran a randomized control trial on assertive linkage. So each new admission was randomized to one of three conditions. They got the, the leaflet, they got the booking in doctor telling them that they had to attend, or they got a peer who would come to them before the meetings, talk to them about whichever of the 12-step groups was relevant to them, take them to the meeting, and then take them for a coffee afterwards and see what we, talk about what, what went on. What did we find? The results were pretty stark and dramatic. Giving people a leaflet is an abuse of trees. You might as well just not bother, because if all you do is give somebody a leaflet, nobody goes. It may or may not suit your thinking to find out that doctors telling you to go is not much better than giving people a leaflet. A peer who came and actively took folk to meetings and talked to them about it, not only did we get more attendance on the ward, we also got more 12-step attendance in the three months post-departure, and we got significant, statistically significant improvements in the substance use in the three months post-departure in this chaotic, high-risk population. This is assertive linkage. This is what assertive linkage means. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with AA or Narcotics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous. The point is about the process. And I would argue that whether you are talking about education, training, recreational activities, mutual aid groups, the point about assertive linkage is ensuring that people get through the door. But the first phase of this is what's called asset-based community development. And that is for you as professionals to find out what is out there and how can you identify those key contagious resources that exist in the community. 
Um, for me, the, the work in, in this area is continuing. We, we've got a, a really innovative project with the Salvation Army in a place called Duralong on the central coast where they have a residential rehab. And we're trying to create a model there of what we're calling reciprocal community development. And what reciprocal community development means is they are turning their therapeutic community into a community resource, so providing a cafe for the local community, providing access to horse riding and to um, some of the other facilities they have in the centre, partly as a mechanism for trying to build community linkages and build community resources. So to very quickly summarise, because I, I fear I'm in danger of outstaying my welcome, to very quickly summarise, the key points, I guess, for me are People learn to recover from watching other people recover. Recovery is a socially contagious process that is maintained through group identity and group membership. For some people, they have those indigenous resources. They have access to those sober, safe groups. But for many, many of the people that we deal with, they don't have access to those resources. So there's a crucial challenge for professionals to work out what are the resources that exist in that person's social network that can be tapped into? And where they're insufficient or non-existent, then the core responsibility of case management or care coordination is to act as the bridge, the assertive linkage mechanism. And where possible, that can't be done only through professionals. That has to involve partnerships with communities and the development of peer support groups to enable that process to happen. Thank you.